Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. Uh, we are back with new shows for 2013. And uh, again, you can always find us online at rce-cast.com. You can find all the old shows there, subscribe, look up at our blogs, and find all of our Twitters and stuff like that. I also have with me Jeff Swires of Cisco Systems and one of the authors of OpenMPI. Jeff, thanks again for your time. Hey, Brock. Welcome to 2013, even though it's, you know, really December 2012. But don't tell anybody that. It's... Yes, we're recording this ahead of time, and it will be released. It'll be the first show released in the new year, but we are recording it at the end of the previous year. Uh, scheduling. <laughs> so what okay. we got, Brock? Okay, so today we have uh, DMTCP, and we have two people from Northeastern University here that so are developers of it. We have Gene Cooperman and uh, Kapul Aaron. Um, let's, once again, I'm sure I killed that name. Yeah, let's give the standard disclaimer that we're ugly Americans and we're terrible at pronouncing uh, other nationality names. So when, uh, why don't we have you guys introduce yourselves and give the correct pronunciation of your names. So, uh, hi, I'm uh, Gene Cooperman. Uh, really pleased to uh, be here. And... Uh, so just, uh, I guess, a little bit about my bio. Way back a long time ago, my degree was in applied math. Uh, I, uh, at some point, got heavily involved in uh, parallel computing, uh, computational algebra, and so on. And one thing led to another, uh, and at some point, I started w worrying, if this program keeps on running for a long time, and then the computer crashes in the middle, what are we going to do? And so then, uh, at some point, I became heavily invested in checkpoint restart, maybe around 2004, 2005. Hi, um, I'm Kapil Adria, and um, I'm actually a fifth year PhD student with uh, Professor Cooperman. And uh, uh, before coming here, I was uh, I finished my degree uh, in like my bachelor's in computer science from India, and uh, glad to be here. Okay, so give us a little bit of background. Uh, DMTCP. It was only recently brought to my attention. W what is it? So. Uh, it stands for distributed multi-threaded checkpointing. Um, so uh, this is what happens when you uh, ask the students to come up with a name for a project. Uh, but the good news is that you can Google on it and you will always get our project. You'll never get something else. Um, so the idea is, is that you have a program running and you want to save its state into a checkpoint image, restart it later, restart multiple copies, whatever you want to do. And um, it should be totally transparent. You shouldn't have to modify the binary. You shouldn't have to modify the operating system. It should just work. And that's the basis of what we're doing. Now, what is the point of this? Why, why is checkpointing a good, good thing? So you said a second ago that, you know, I've got this long-running program and the computer dies. What happens? But is that a, a practical problem? Does this happen in real life? And, you know, what does having something like DMTCP um, mean to the application developer and the end user? So, <clears throat> yeah, it, uh, it, it's a really important problem. So in high-performance computing, batch queues and so on, <clears throat> people have known about this uh, forever. Uh, suppose you're given a certain slot of time, up to 24 hours, and your program is going to take 36 hours. What do you do? Uh, this is one of the places where people would often come to us. Um, but then... Um, there are a lot of just ordinary people working on the desktop who uh, want to run a program for a long time, maybe on their laptop, and they don't really want to keep their laptop in one place for the next 72 hours. Um, so it just adds a lot of flexibility. And then later in the program, we, we hope to talk about some more unusual applications of Checkpoint Restart, which go far beyond the original high-performance computing. So a lot of high-performance computing applications, large parallel applications, already have checkpointing built into the application itself. Why make something like this? So this is a great point. Um, so people distinguish between application-level checkpointing and system-level or transparent uh, checkpointing. Uh, at the application level, the programmer has to work harder to make it happen. If you're running on some kind of supercomputer, uh, then the machine is expensive and you just spend the human resources to do it. Uh, and so that's not really the area in which we play. But for uh, ordinary researchers, which may have uh, a smaller research group, 
maybe they're scientists and they don't want to spend their time writing uh, unusual code in order to save only their data structures and nothing else. If they get it wrong, they just have to start over. Um, using DMTCP, it's a no-brainer. No you just start under DMTCP and you ignore it. And whenever you want, you can set a checkpoint. You can do it on, on a timer at regular intervals. You can have your program ask for a checkpoint when it wants it. Uh, and, and then it just works behind the scenes, uh, which is the way the best software should work. So compared to the application level checkpoint, though, what's some of the... So that was the benefits. What's some of the downsides to using this transparent checkpointing? Um, so the downsides it, in initially is we've taken a philosophy that we don't modify the kernel, the binary, or anything. Therefore, when it comes time to checkpoint, we have to work harder to interrogate, uh, for example, the kernel about any missing state. Uh, we do support distributed computations. We have to work harder to figure out what data is in the network. Um, so especially in the early years of DMTCP, our coverage was not as good as we would like. Um, we're, we've been working to improve that coverage now, uh, adding a number of heuristics and more recently plugins so that the end user can easily add coverage to checkpoint aspects that we don't uh, directly handle. So that sounds kind of like magic, right? You said you don't change the application, you don't change the kernel. Um, how does this work then? Yeah, it's, it's a good point. Um, so the, the simplest example is suppose you have an open file at the time of checkpoint. Uh, what we'll do is, uh, this, so I should say this works primarily under Linux right now, although we, there seems to be a recent port to Android that we're also excited about. Um, and because we can checkpoint a virtual machine, we can checkpoint Windows inside the virtual machine. In any case, um, to take an example, suppose you have an open file at the time of checkpoint. Then uh, in Linux, you go to the proc file system, find what your open files are. Using LSeq, you can determine what is the current offset. You save that. Uh, and then when you restart, we restore all of memory, so the program doesn't even know that it was checkpointed. It just assumes it's continuing. It looks up the offset and sets the offset back to what it should be, opens the file descriptor to the original descriptor uh, number, and so on. Now, you said earlier, too, that it can fire via a timer. Is that via a signal, or, or uh, what, what mechanism is that? Um, the simplest way to do it is uh, to let DMTCP handle, uh, use its own internal timer. So the D stands for distributed. Uh, when you have distributed processes, you want to have a central coordinator that talks to everybody. Uh, so the end user talks to the coordinator, and all of his applications register themselves with the coordinator. A late process on a new computer can just join the, the computation by calling up the coordinator. And then the coordinator has a timer. When the timer goes off, it will send a message to each of the individual processes saying it's time to checkpoint. Meanwhile, we've added a, at the same time, we have added a hijack library in each user process. And that hijack library has created a checkpoint thread, which is our code and is listening to the coordinator to find out when it's time to checkpoint. I see. So you're running off in, a, in an extra thread over there and then can just wake up whenever you choose to, whether it's by an event or a timer or, or whatever you want. How do you uh, stop the main thread, well, actually all the other threads, and, and restart that? That seems like you have to get into a little bit of plumbing there. Um, we, we do a little, uh, but it, uh, it seems to work well. So the sequence of events is this. Uh, at the time, typically the user will just start up their own application. That application might transparently create a coordinator if there is not already one at the default location. Uh, after that, uh, the application runs our hijack library first uh, using currently the LD preload feature of Linux, but there are other ways to do that. 
uh, this creates our own checkpoint thread. The checkpoint thread then sets up a signal handler. Uh, by default, it's SIG user 2. Uh, when, uh, and then when it's time to checkpoint, our checkpoint thread sends that signal, SIG user 2, to each of the user threads. The user thread goes into the interrupt handler for it that we declared, and now the user thread is executing our code. Since we control him now, we uh, force him into a lock, and he has to wait there while we save all of user space memory to disk. So does this thread literally not have to do anything until a point of checkpoint, so there's no overhead for running when not checkpointing? Um, certainly, our checkpoint thread does nothing while the user threads are operating, and we take this as a point of principle because we don't want to have any race conditions. So either we're running or the user's running, but never both at the same time. We do have some minor overhead in another respect. Um, there are certain subtle cases where we want to know what the user thread is doing. So we put wrapper functions around certain system calls, uh, usually the ones that are called only infrequently. Uh, and so this can tell us when uh, perhaps a socket connection was opened. Uh, then we record. So, but now in this case, the user thread will ask for a socket connection through the normal system call. That will be intercepted. He'll end up executing our wrapper function first. Our wrapper fun function, still being executed by the user thread, will save in a special place information about this new socket and then pass on the parameters to the normal system call, which then again returns, uh, but all under control of the user thread. So there's been other transparent checkpointing uh, projects out there, and most of them relied on kernel modifications. Why did you decide not to do that, and because you don't modify, what does that cause you to have to do? Yeah, so this is certainly a favorite subject of ours. Uh, what are the pros and cons of kernel-based checkpoint restart versus uh, completely transparent, no modifications? Um, if you just want to get a quick checkpoint restart up and running rapidly, then probably the easiest thing is just to go in there and modify the kernel. Uh, the problem is that the kernel keeps changing over time, and so therefore uh, there's now responsibility to maintain code within the kernel. Uh, our view is that we try to stay close to the POSIX API. The POSIX API is extremely stable, and as long as we stay close to that, the code doesn't have to change. So it's been many, many, many Linux versions now when we have not had to change anything about the MTCP. There's a new kernel, and everything continues to work. Um, so this is probably the biggest difference in philosophy. We have to work harder to discover what's inside the kernel. We're not there since uh, we do that through system calls and the proc file system. Uh, but on the other hand, because we are staying close to POSIX APIs and the proc file system API, our API doesn't change, and therefore the code continues to work across most versions of Linux 2.6. Okay, so then the one question would be is, you can keep track of threads that get spawned. What about applications that kind of do like the, the fork exec, you know, where it completely loses track of its child? Yep. So one of our rules is that we try to be contagious. Uh, so we have our hijack library on the initial process. Uh, if it calls fork, there's no problem. Our hijack library now exists in the child process also. And we have a wrap around fork to make some minor adjustments. If exec is called... Again, we make sure that the LD preload environment variable is set so we get our hijack library. And to take it one step further, we also have to be contagious, for example, if we're checkpointing an MPI application. Since we're transparent, we don't know that is an MPI application. Uh, can, um, but what will happen is an MPI application will usually start on one node and then generate processes on other nodes using SSH. So we, since we're spying on system calls anyway, we look for any call to SSH. If we find that they're passing an SSH command, then we modify that command line to make sure that LD preload will also be present on that command line. So we're contagious 
through fork, through SSH, obviously when extra new threads are created and so on. Now, what happens if the MPI doesn't use uh, um, system or exec and SSH and things like that, but some other resource manager API to launch on remote servers? So if they're using a different resource manager, again, there has to be some system call or call to an MPI library that is used by the resource manager to create new MPI processes. So on the principle of being contagious, we would put wrappers around that and make sure to include our hijack library via LD preload or a different mechanism. So I would like to add here, uh, we recently had uh, this for Talk. Talk actually uses this uh, remote spawn API to create remote processes. So if uh, an MPI application is running on Talk, it actually is not using SSH. So we actually uh, do put wrappers around the system call, which actually creates the processes and uh, uh, be contagious. Okay, well, let, me, let me specialize you a little further. And, uh, we, we worked together a little bit before to get uh, DMTCP in OpenMPI. What do you guys do there? Because we don't really, in OpenMPI, we don't really do that at all, right? We launch actually uh, a remote daemon, and the daemon is the guy who launches the MPI processes and things like that. And we might use a, a variety of APIs, um, certainly not just SSH. So how do you guys work under OpenMPI? So... Um, that's a good example because there we have two ways of doing the checkpoint. Uh, the first way is what I, we described earlier. Essentially, DMTCP is sitting on top and checkpoints every process in OpenMPI, including daemons and anything else. Uh, but the other way is uh, OpenMPI has a very nice checkpoint restart service with a well-defined API. Uh, and so in that case... What we do is we use only our in that, in that case, OpenMPI assumes that it will be responsible for stopping the network traffic, and then it will notify the checkpoint package for each individual process, saying it's time to checkpoint this one process. So in that case, we use only the lowest layer, which is MTCP. There's no D because it's not distributed anymore. It's for a single process. Uh, it's simple. There's no coordinator. Our library, again, is a hijack library in the user's process, and that single process is then checkpointed. Okay, so for a little bit of clarification here for me, who has not done this, this is something that me as a user can install using the system MPI library that's been installed by the sysadmin, right? Uh, correct. And and uh, at OpenMPI, they've uh, qualified our... Uh, uh, our MTCP uh, uh, attachment is basically working. Okay, so this all happens on the node that initially spawns this and this gets trapped and attached before it goes to the other machine to start the other process. Uh, yep. Yes. Basically what happens is that uh, these good Northeastern folks have uh, written a plugin for OpenMPI that uses our underlying checkpoint, right? And so when you MPI run a process, um, as Gene was saying, they're not really involved in the distribution of the process, but we might wake them up later, so to speak, if OpenMPI requests a checkpoint. It'll kind of halt all the network traffic um, and then jump into the MTCP library to actually checkpoint each individual MPI process. That is correct, right, Gene? Uh, yeah, that's a nice explanation. Thank you. A and in a similar way, going beyond uh, MPI, uh, there's Condor for high-throughput computing. Uh, and, and there also we have a similar mechanism for working with them. Uh, in their case, there's a certain glue script. And the glue script, instead of uh, running the application directly with Condor, it will also bring in the uh, the MTCP libraries and run the two together. And so for Condor also, one can get automatic checkpoint and restart. Uh, oh, and I should say, this is on their vanilla universe. They have an older standard universe from the 1990s where they have a more limited form of checkpoint, which works very well for single-threaded processes. But they, I guess, don't have the resource to work to develop more general checkpoint packages. Okay, so you mentioned OpenMPI, you mentioned Condor, which is both a resource manager and an environment. 
what other MPI libraries do you guys know to work with or other novel parallel distributed systems? So, a couple of you have done more of this work. Yeah, so uh, we have verified it with MPH2 also in, in sense of uh, parallel uh, things. Uh, it's uh, OpenMP is also supported and uh, so is Silk. So, yeah, we do support all these. Oh, OpenMP, there were some interesting horror stories in, in getting that working. Maybe you want to tell a little about it. Yeah, with OpenMP, things were uh, quite different from the rest of the applications. Uh, one of the things that bit us was uh, the rapid creation and destruction of threads. So as it turns out, OpenMP, OpenMP actually creates a lot of threads and destroys them pretty rapidly. So we ran into issues of um, PID conflicts uh, or the thread ID conflicts. So Basically, whenever a thread is created, the kernel assigns a thread ID. And uh, later on, when a new thread is created, it assigns a new thread ID. But what if uh, you have created so many threads that uh, thread IDs are now wrapped around? And basically, a later thread gets the same thread ID as an older thread. And those were some of the issues which we ran into. And that actually was where we had to... Um, uh, basically design a new layer of virtualization where we virtualized all the PIDs and TIDs. So instead of uh, uh, telling the application about the kernel IDs, we actually generate a virtual TID for each process thread. So this is a good example, going back to the discussion we had earlier about uh, kernel-based checkpointing versus um, user space transparent checkpointing. In kernel-based check checkpointing, you have the luxury of saying at restart time, I'll look up what the old process ID was, and I will start the new process with exactly the same process ID. And I, I just hope that there's no current process that has already reserved that process ID. So, so, so this is one of the basic challenges. Uh, prior to checkpoint, the process saved its process ID. After restart, it thinks it has the same process ID. In the kernel method, they say, yes, you do have the same process ID. We will guarantee it. Uh, we just and um, on the other hand, in our case, we put wrappers around every system call that might ever refer to a process ID. And when the user asks for a pro what his process ID is, we don't give him the true process ID. We give him a virtual process ID. And then we proceed to translate between virtual and real process IDs always. Then at restart time, the real process ID may change. The kernel may assign a new real process ID but we just adjust our table, and the user is still working with virtual process IDs. So we think that this is actually more flexible. There's less danger of a thread ID conflict or process ID conflict in cases where a huge number of threads are created. Uh, let me jump back to the OpenMP bit there. I have a clarifying question to ask about that. So before, when you're talking about uh, checkpointing single-threaded processes, uh, you had mechanisms to make that main thread stop um, and then restart it and so on. So how do you do that when there could be lots of threads running? Do you guarantee to stop them all or do you just kind of catch them wherever you catch them or, or how does that work? So uh, basically we use the same signaling mechanism to stop all the user threads and once uh, everyone has entered the signal handler, we make them wait for the lock and that's the point where the checkpoint thread starts and uh, saves the checkpoint image to disk. Currently, we put a wrapper function around the thread create uh, so that we know all the threads that the user has ever created. In an alternative design, we could use the proc file system to discover all the threads the user has created. Okay, so the threads wait for a signal to actually and like synchronize and checkpoint. What about for uninterruptible things like I.O.? So, uh, with I.O., what we do is, uh, when you have suspended the thread, there might be pending I.O., uh, like data in buffers or data in the network, and we actually drain that data before we uh, write the checkpoint image. So, we query the kernel or the network to get every single bit of data into the process memory, and then we just save it to the checkpoint image. And similarly, when we write, we uh, flush all data to disk. Uh, at checkpoint time. 
Okay, and then like you're keeping track of all these threads, but you mentioned with OpenMP, it spawns and it creates and destroys threads very, very quickly. Do you start getting into some noticeable overhead in that kind of situation? So yeah, this is a, this was a very interesting case. Uh, when we uh, were actually uh, developing this work, uh, we noticed that uh, there was a considerable overhead because of some of the things that we were doing. Um, uh, mostly related to uh, the system called pthread join where the main thread actually waits for the threads to die and there were some uh, issues with that uh, in that particular implementation that caused the overhead as as high as uh, 20% but uh, in, in the current uh, code base we have uh, brought it down to uh, pretty minimal so it's like less than a percent or so I, I should add that we uh, have been really lucky to have a, a great user base uh, that gives us a lot of this feedback. So the issues with performance for OpenMP, this was brought to us uh, by some of our users, in fact, for the trunk SVN even before a release. Uh, and so we're always grateful to uh, uh, communicate with our users. So now you mentioned uh, stuff for disk activity, but what do you do about the network? Because the network is a little more amorphous. You can't necessarily guarantee what's happening on the other side. What kind of guarantees do you give about socket reads and writes? Uh, that's a great point. And in fact, in 2004, DMCCP started as an undergraduate project. And the undergraduate student actually came up with this uh, initial idea. Uh, other people have done this before, of course, but uh, nevertheless, for him, it was original. Uh, the idea is that if there's data in the uh, network, then uh, at the time of checkpoint, after we have forced all the user threads to stop, we then look at each of our sockets, and at the send end of the socket, we send a special cookie, uh, some unusual data pattern, uh, and then there's a barrier, and then we look at the receive end of every socket, and we proceed to read from the receive end of every socket until we see that cookie. And when we see it, we know now there's no more data in the network so this is great when it's a closed computation. But in addition, we have also had to worry about uh, the rest of the world. Sometimes there is still Vim. We can checkpoint Vim, but Vim will keep a, uh, a socket open to the X server. Uh, there are examples where the NSC daemon will keep a shared memory region. So for each of these cases, we've also had to develop certain heuristics. But here we believe we have an advantage in doing this totally in user space uh, at a kernel-based checkpoint restart package could not handle this and would still need a user space component in order to supplement that uh, for these reasons. All right, well, continuing on in the network vein, what about the, um, you know, the OS bypass API like Verbs? where a lot of what's happening in the network is directly in the hardware and you have no insight into uh, – you, you can't probe the OS, the proc file system or anything like that to find out what's going on. Do you wrap all of those calls too or hand do you, how do you handle outstanding completions? So, um, so there um, also we have to wrap. Uh, this was work which uh, a lot of it was done by uh, – uh, an undergraduate student here, uh, Gregory Kerr. Uh, so uh, I've forgotten all of the details, but I remember there was a certain context associated with this, and we had to create a shadow context beyond the context. And there, we would put wrappers around various uh, functions for the verbs that had to deal with this. We would give it the shadow context, and then we would copy to the real context that the hardware actually talked to. Uh, but the other part of this ultimately is at the time of checkpoint, we just have to pause a little to guarantee that there's no more network traffic. So something as a sysadmin I'd be curious about is, do you guys integrate with any of the existing resource managers and schedulers for, say, checkpointing a process that the scheduler decided needs to be preempted to make space for a higher priority user? Um, some of our users have implemented that. Uh, so I guess there was an example, Grid Engine, uh, a couple of you, you were talking with them. 
So uh, there was one particular example where uh, they actually wrote some scripts for Grid Engine to use DMTCP with Grid Engine to do all the uh, preemption and, and so on. And then more recently, and, Amazon Cloud. Uh, so yeah, there is this one guy who He's actually uh, he contacted us because he wanted to checkpoint or use DMTCP to checkpoint uh, these scientific computations which are running on Amazon EC2 Cloud. So there also he is uh, writing the DMTCP plugins to integrate DMTCP and uh, uh, to DM, uh, integrate DMTCP to use the Amazon EC2 APIs to do the preemption and checkpoint and restart. Okay, and uh, there was something on your website I noticed. Um, URDB. What is the relationship with that and you guys? So uh, URDB stands for Universal Reversible Debugger. So, uh, so it's it's a nice thing. Uh, although I must uh, warn you that this actually is deprecated, and we have a new cousin of uh, URDB, which uh, we are planning to release uh, like early next year. And that is called FRED, which stands for Fast Reversible Debugger. So uh, instead of uh, talking about URDB, why don't we talk about uh, FRED itself? Yes, URDB was uh, to handle single-threaded processes. Uh, FRED handles uh, multi-threaded processes. Um, so the first thing that was needed is we needed to be able to checkpoint ptrace. Uh, and so we had a series of these challenges. Uh, Ptrace was the next one. Eventually, we did it. Still later, we converted that into a plugin to make everything more modular. So it's not part of the core of the MTCP. It comes with a distribution, but one can load it in or unload it. This gives us the ability to checkpoint GDB. If you want a reversible debugger, then uh, the way you can do it is put the MTCP on top of a GDB session, allow for the user to give the debugging commands. Suppose he has given 100 commands since the last checkpoint. You want to go back one command. Just restart and go forward 99 commands. To make this work, there are several software components that one needs. You need to checkpoint GDB. We can do that because we can checkpoint ptrace. Um, you need a deterministic record replay component because if you have multiple threads when you replay you want to make sure that on replay you arrive at the same place where you were originally um, and I guess you uh, want a uh, Python in our case a Python script at the top to control all of this to control the checkpoint restart deterministic record replay uh, and uh, naturally, you need the debugger. Uh, mostly, we're using GDB as the debugger, but the method works for many debuggers. And when you say next year, you you actually mean uh, this year, right? Because we're in 2013, <laughs> wink, wink, right? <laughs> yes. That's yeah. very good point. Since, since we're talking in the past, yes. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, so that's actually pretty fascinating. So. Uh, let me ask a clarification question about the deterministic replay bit. Are there? Do you support everything in GDB? Like if I run for a while in GDB and then hit Control C to get a command prompt back, you know, I interrupt my program. Do you support that kind of mode as well? Uh, definitely not in the initial version. Um, right now, our goal is to get the basics working and then get feedback from the users about what they want in practice. Um, so already the release of FRED has been delayed because we were worried about making sure that it was close enough to production quality. Uh, and then we can release it as beta software, get feedback, and eventually maybe get to, into the subtle issues that you're talking about. Okay, so if I'm uh, writing an application and I'm just planning on using DMTCP to checkpoint it, do I need to be aware of anything to make sure that my application currently works? Uh, I would say no. Uh, what we try to tell people is that uh, if the application doesn't work, then we consider it a bug. Tell us and we want to fix it. Uh, because we're working totally in user space, we have a number of heuristics to handle special cases. Um, we mentioned uh, NSCD, Network Services Caching Daemon, um, 
next servers and so on. Uh, but ultimately, uh, we want to continue to add heuristics and plugins to handle these extra cases. Let me ask, uh, this is a little off topic here, but it's something I like to ask everybody is, uh, what kind of uh, source control do you use and uh, why? I think you actually said subversion already, but uh, I always love to hear people's uh, reasons for why they pick what they pick. So in 2005 or so, subversion seemed the right way to go. is easy to use and it worked. Um, but I guess now there's also more of a preference for Git. So uh, we, we try to support both through various schemes. A couple can tell you more. So uh, uh, with the centralized thing uh, or the source code project page, we uh, have subversion there. But we also have a GitHub project page, which um, is in some sense secondary. But uh, that, that is where we have the Git repository. And I personally have been using uh, Git over SVN or uh, or Git SVN for the past uh, couple of years or so for uh, uh, the development. We just don't want to move from uh, move the servers and repository to Git at source for. We just want to make old people happy. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> keep the historical uh, context so we can go back to the different versions uh, easily. Uh, but who knows? Maybe in the future we could switch to Git. Uh, as our primary uh, version control system. All right, I want to flash back to much earlier in the conversation. You said something that I, I knew I wanted to return to. You said that uh, you can now checkpoint Android. Um, can you give us a little details on that? Why is that useful? What's cool about it? Who did it? All these kinds of things. So, uh, yeah, well, this is something we're really excited about, and it happened only in the last month. We were quite surprised. Uh, Internally, I was working with an undergraduate student who uh, poured the lowest layer, MTCP, to Android. And then in the middle of that, uh, we noticed, uh, I I guess, basically a a new Git uh, source, uh, GitHub source, uh, which was talking about porting porting the MTCP to Android. Uh, we got in touch with the developers, uh, Kito Cheng and Jim Huang, uh, working for Zero X Lab in Taiwan. And they've done a magnificent job. They have slides about it. Uh, and uh, their Android is developing very rapidly, so there's still some things to catch up on. But uh, it seems to work, and it allows us to play in a whole new area. Um, Separately, in What's February, the use case? What's the use case for that? So, do you want to checkpoint your phone, or? Okay. Oh, and I should just add: in in February, we had uh, ported the MTCP to ARM. Also, it works on Intel and on ARM. Um, so, yeah, why would you want to checkpoint your phone? So, in Tai in Taiwan, there are many uh, companies that uh, develop for uh, smartphones. And, you know, as they say, um, if there's a bug in the field, what are they going to do about it? Especially suppose it's some device, say, in your refrigerator or TV. You're going to bring that in. Uh, so what they would like to do is uh, when something crashes to just checkpoint it, and then they can develop this software so that the customer will send the checkpoint image to the developers for analysis. Um, and then they're also very interested in our work on Fred because then they can also get some of the history of what the customer was doing and also send that to the developers. Uh, there's uh, uh, another use case. They want faster boot times. And so they actually checkpoint. Uh, they are using some sort of virtual machine, which they checkpoint. And then uh, when they are booting up, the machi- uh, booting up the device, instead of actually going through the entire boot up procedure, they can just restart from the checkpoint image and continue saving the boot up time. That, that, that's an excellent point. Uh, that, that will lead into another thing we'd like to talk about, uh, checkpointing a virtual machine very fast. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about that. So uh, virtualization is pretty hot, particularly uh, in the company that I work for, Cisco. We play a lot in the virtualization space, and there's a tremendous amount of innovation happening in that area across the entire industry. So how are you guys contributing to that? So we just wrote a, a technical report on archive.org this week. Um, so we, um, as I said, if, if we can't checkpoint it, then our view is that's a bug and we want to fix it. One of the things we'd noticed is we could not checkpoint virtual machines. So why not? Uh, 
And uh, since we have this plugin architecture, which allows us to make things modular, we could just have a different plugin for each new virtual machine. Uh, so with some students, uh, Rohan Garg and uh, uh, Kamal Soda, uh, we've now done this. Uh, it works for KVM slash KMU. It works for user space KMU. In fact, in that case, apparently our checkpoint restart always worked for user space KMU. We just never got around to testing it. Uh, and we've made it work for LGUEST, which is a very small virtual machine, great for learning how virtual machines work. Uh, and the other thing that we're really fascinated by is um, since we wanted to take a whole snapshot, we want to save not just the virtual machine, but also the guest file system. And how can we do that fast? Well, now there's this butter file system, BTRFS. Um, several distributions are talking about making that their default in about a year. And uh, this allows you to take a, a snapshot because this is a copy on write file system. You take a snapshot and the running process continues to write to the guest file system. Um, so now we can checkpoint in 0 0.2 seconds currently and we haven't even tried to make it fast. This is just what works out of the box. When we work, when we get interested in making it faster, I will probably get down to maybe 10 milliseconds. It's hard to say. That is pretty impressive. So that's some pretty strange uses of stuff there, checkpointing refrigerators and virtual machines and <laughs> cell phones and their stuff. So uh, what's coming in the future of DMTCP? Uh, Kapil, would you like to talk about some ideas? So one of the things uh, that I've been working uh, is uh, the plugin architecture for DMTCP. So uh, we want the users to be able to write their own heuristics. So, of course, we can uh, take care of uh, doing a very uh, 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 very robust checkpoint restart of the entire process. But sometimes the users uh, may want something special, like uh, if they have a huge memory footprint and they don't care about half the memory, then why checkpoint it? So we, we basically want them to be able to have plugins uh, so that they can write the plugins, and these plugins will actually take care of specific tasks which uh, currently DMTCP as a whole is handling. So we have also, uh, we have moved our own uh, uh, stuff into plugins and so, so that we can reduce the size of the DMTCP core. But uh, we uh, definitely want the users to be able to write the plugins. And then I should say that um, it seems like each year we uh, have more and more uh, developers and semi-developers around the world uh, who are contributing to DMTCP. Uh, and, and that's been exciting also. So uh, we're really, I believe, getting to some kind of critical mass now where it's hard for me to predict what we will have a year from now because people are contributing new ideas from anywhere. But that's, that's part of the motivation why we think these third-party plugins are so important and we really want to support them. Okay, so where can people find more information about DMTCP? Probably the easiest way is Google DMTCP. The uh, good news about having an unusual name is there are no conflicts. Um, but uh, the main site is dmtcp.sf.net, SourceForge. Uh, couple, do you have other uh, places they should look at? Uh, no, if you just start from the SourceForge uh, web page for DMTCP, you'll, you'll find all the links out there. In, including um, examples of supported applications and um, uh, something we call the closed world assumption. Uh, as long as your application is not talking to the rest of the world, we believe we can checkpoint it fine. When it's talking also to the rest of the world, that's when you need... Uh, plugins. For example, if you're talking to a database, you could write a plugin to disconnect from the database at the time of checkpoint and then restart immediately after when you resume. Cool. Okay, well, Gene, Kapoor, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, we really enjoyed this. Yep, same here. Thanks, guys.